I just think there's a lot of different ways to evaluate a place. Yeah. And sometimes people will go into a, a restaurant or a food stand or something, a walk-up window. Yeah. And they're expecting something that the place just doesn't do. Yeah. And they're mad about that. And it's like, well, that's it's an expectation kind of thing. on you, you know, like. Yeah. Acknowledge. You should have thought of that before. Or you maybe done more homework, you know, like, and yeah. or just like, if you didn't have a good meal, just accept it. Just take the L, like take the L. <laughs> yeah. Like, guess what? We don't always get what we want. Hey, Victoria. Hey, Chelsea. You know what I could use right now? I have no idea what could you use right now. A breath of fresh movie. All right. Yeah. That thing we do every week. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you're listening to a breath of fresh movie this is a podcast where you chelsea pope and you victoria harley uh, we watch a movie neither one of us has ever seen before and then we talk about it yes that's it that's the that's that's the tweet there's more but, yeah, we've got know. more minutes to this episode, for instance, because mm. we have more to say than just what we do. We do the thing that we talk about. Yeah. What do they say? Uh, show, don't tell. We, yeah. We're showing you. We're showing you we're what so, we tell. Showing your ears. But we're not telling you what we're going to tell. <laughs> yeah. We're showing you with our mouths to your ears. Use the, your mouth to tell your ears the to truth. Listen. To the I truth. I mean, <laughs> to listen. <laughs> listen to the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Good. All right. We're sworn in. All right. Uh, so this week's movie is the 1992 erotic thriller. I love an erotic Ew, thriller. I I just, I already went. Okay, continue. Uh, Poison Ivy. All right. Directed by Cat Shay. Erotic um, thriller. I mean, Ugh. so, okay. I like love an erotic thriller. This does not register high on that scale for me. Right. Though, like, no, I just want to also preface before Victoria goes on by saying that like <laughs> she chose this I like did. excitedly. Yeah. I thought this was going to be great. And actually earlier today she texted happy poison Ivy day. Yeah. It's poison Ivy day today. Today's at breath poison. of fresh movie. <laughs> I think I just honestly wanted to check in and it was just a different way of checking in with that. Was, <laughs> that was your way of trying to test the waters to see. And when you say it like that, it makes me think you like it. So like, I didn't oh, want to tell you anything other than you know what, what I wrote back. We, yeah, <laughs> I did occur to me actually, when I sent it, I was like, you know what? She's going to think I like the movie. That now. is exactly what I thought when you uh, sent that text. No, not a huge fan, but there's a lot we can discuss absolutely though. there's things there's things of merit um but i do like discussing how we yeah. chose this movie and also just how we yeah. choose the movies in general i feel like sometimes yeah. we don't well we haven't done an erotic thriller yet yeah we yeah. haven't you're right i'm also curious to what put this one on your radar specifically because this was yeah. this was something that well, you brought up i i don't have original thoughts i just what? do i just do what the criterion puts in front of me you sure know? and this was part of some Sundance 1992, the oh. class of 90s. Oh, this was a Sundance movie. This, I didn't know that. Yeah, this it was. Okay. So <laughs> a lot of movies in 1992 were like redefining indie cinema in mm -hmm. America. So this kind of got lumped in with that. Sure. Um, I don't think unfairly, but I know not everything on Criterion is good. I know this. Like, well, yeah, we watched Office Killer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes it's more about like, well, it's culturally significant. Like, all right, great. Yeah, okay. yeah. But, you know, it means that sometimes you get some campy stuff, you get some trashy stuff. And I like trash, you know? I, I was, I'm, I'm down for that too. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, it, like, I already think it's super valuable what you're just sharing right now as far as, like, indie cinema, 1982, yeah, right. Sunday. I just, I mean, I think that's, I, mean, I think I, it's important context. I mean, I was surprised to find out this was a critical favorite. I'm like, really? Yeah, <laughs> like, this is, it's, it's, although you know, some, apparently some people did walk out of Sundance kind of noisily, though. Like, I'm, I, I might have been one of them. Yeah. I would, the, the, you know, here's the, the duality of this, like, you know, because on one hand, like, this is a very competently made film. Yeah. This does everything that a script and a storytelling is supposed to do. But my God, some of those scenes are repulsive. It's hard. I to am watch. just disgusted by some of the uh, the pedophilia. Uh, that, and not even just yeah. I'm not even just trying to say that from like my little soapbox or whatever. Like it's genuinely gross. Yeah. Like it, the uh, the uh, the 
the effectiveness of the chemistry between Drew Barrymore and Tom Selleck is they're they're Tom they, Scarrett. Tom Scarrett. Tom Selleck. <laughs> Tom Scarrett. Tom Scarrett. How? Oh God! How could I mess that up? No, and that's fine. From shoes. I just I just wanted to make it clear. That's from Kelly's shoes. I just really wanted to make it Tom clear. Tom Scarrett. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. It's it specifically. Tom Selleck did not. Was no. Not a part of this. I don't know. I, yeah. I feel. No. I. I've. I. Yeah. I um, mean, this is a small cast. There's basically four people in this. It's there, and it's there. There's a lot that they're carrying there's a lot going on uh yeah character wise for every single player in this i do think the characters are all genuinely fleshed out in the sense that like you know yeah there's some two-dimensional stuff going on in terms of the or one-dimensional maybe is the better term i don't know one two whatever however much you want you know there's 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 a lot of uh, yeah there's a lot of shallow just getting from point to a to point b kind of shit going on with the script it feels but at the same time everybody plays their part to a 10 yeah everybody does what they what they showed up to do um but i have i'm not shocked at all that that people walked out there's just some nasty there's just some nasty stuff in this and i love sexy stuff i'm not an apologist for lolita in that i think like humbert humbert's a good character like uh, like you have to be messed up to think he's a good character. like that that shit's gross but yeah. i'm an apologist for lolita as like a work of art and and right, right. it and its relevance and importance and sure. like the story and whatnot so i'm on board with like powering through these kinds of stories to see the merit I mean, it was distractingly gross. There were a lot of like, yeah, I, the, for I, all the people getting up in arms about like licorice pizza, blah blah blah. Age gap. Uh, it's like okay, well, watch Poison Ivy. Yeah, really. Get some, <laughs> just let's just, just grow up. Just uh, <laughs> like, let's just check in here. Yeah, um, let's just let's. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, not. Maybe I mean, that's a bad. That's a bad the, argument. Yeah, like it. if I had to like dip my fingers into this movie, the words that come to mind are things like sleazy and kind of dull. Like in a weird Sleazy way. Sleazy like, and dull at the same it's like, time. It's sort of sleepy. Like it takes, I mean, yeah. okay, the sex is gross, which is a bummer. For sure. You know, because a erotic thriller, it's like you get that mixture of like kind of horror, but also the sex, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I don't know. I, I There's a podcast that's no longer on called You in Danger Girl. And it was hosted oh, by sure. Janelle James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny comedian. And it was always about erotic thrillers. And so, you know, the, it's a great show. And even though there's only a few in the episodes, please go check that out. Because, yeah. you know, they really get at the heart of like, it's it, it offers these two things for the viewer. But it's always full of like red flags and horrible things are like, oh, he should have turned around at this point. Yeah, you know? right. So, I mean, in this movie, there was a moment where it's like, oh, turn around, turn around, you know. And I think it was really... When she like started putting on the clothes of the mother. Anyway, we're yeah. getting backed up. Just just a no, quick. No, but that's I, I, yeah. a great shout out and also a yeah. great key red flag moment that yeah, happens yeah. at a point in the film that you would think would be closer to the climax. Maybe in a actually way. before that, it's like when she moves in with the family. I was just like, when did that there's, happen? Yeah, there, there's just a lot. Um, there's a lot. There's so a lot. So for no one, who, if you haven't seen Poison Ivy, which is probably a lot of you, I'll yeah. own up to the fact that this played on TV yeah oh periodically yeah, yeah. and so well, i feel like i feel it, like it found are, it found like a uh an audience in cable yeah it and did. vhs it found it found an audience, found an and, audience the, and, and, yeah. and wayward dudes that didn't have anything to do with their daytime life exactly yeah um, but generally poison ivy is about a seductive teen played by drew barrymore befriends an introverted high school student played by sarah gilbert you might know from roseanne she mm-hmm. played darlene and then this seductive teen schemes her way into the lives of this wealthy family. And that's pretty much it. I mean, more things happen, but it's it's just disappointing. Like I said, I think the thing that was disappointing was like, okay, the, the sex was bad, but also it came way too late. Yeah. Like we should have got there in like 20 minutes in. There should have been yeah, a sex it was, scene. It was like, just, it was, you gotta there's get a it. lot of just too, way too much foreplay going there's on. a lot just, of foreplay. Um. I mean, yeah, I, I also feel like, too, yeah, if you're going to go with the, the, the incredible camp that this film, you know, eventually gets to, like, get there faster and yeah. so you can go farther with the time you have. Like, let's, like, really just see this. Well, because it started as, 11. like, one kind of movie and then kind of became, like, a horror movie. Like, but it started somewhere else. Yeah, it, it like... kind of felt in a sense. I mean, you know, it starts early on. Like, I'm immediately 
drawn in to sympathize with Drew Barrymore and she's yeah. not even the narrator of the story. Right, right. I immediately thought that Sarah Gilbert's character was like a privileged little shit. fucking brat yeah. and I didn't give a shit and I was like, yeah, let this let this like like uh broke girl like like come and leak her family. way. Yeah, like yeah. Wait, let's watch some parasite shit happen here. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Like, like <laughs> you were you all fucking get your bag. You were like, team Drew. Um, yeah, I, I was and, totally team Drew yeah. from the get-go. Well, and so this her character, we actually never learned her real name. All right. Yeah, the cheesiness. I like Ivy. It's like a fresh start. Yeah, <laughs> like essentially uh sarah well okay sarah gilbert's name is actually sylvie right right sylvie down. sylvie is the name yeah, of the girl which, that was... which is an interesting sort of inversion of the name ivy in a way that's true um, i don't know if that that probably doesn't have any significance i don't but... know but they both get into trouble at a school and at school and like yeah. then they're getting out and you know uh fucking sylvie's being picked up can she get a ride home with us but right. didn't know her name and so, like, lo- notices a tattoo on her thigh of Ivy, and it's just like, oh, her name's Ivy. And then tells her, hey, your name's Ivy. And then for the rest of the movie, she's Ivy. Like, it's right. not. And I, I really, <laughs> I don't know. I was, like, sort of expecting the other shoe to drop at some point. Because it's like, yeah, do hadn't... we ever get any sort of. No. No, but you know what's so funny? Again, I, I keep, I told you this before the podcast yeah. a bunch of times, but I watched this with Scully with my boyfriend and, like, He's a fun person to watch some of this shit with sometimes because he's such a little snark. And like, as soon as the Ivy thing came up, he immediately was like, we'll never know her name. <laughs> we will never like he's laughing. And I was like, wait, do you really? He's like, yeah, no, we're never going to know her name by the end. Yeah. And like little little shit like like when the like the the, the, the all the balcony shit. Yeah, and he's yeah. just like, just do it. Just do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just push her, push like, her. F- like before the scene even really starts, he's like, just do it. Oh yeah. There was also this weird thing with like literally shoes dropping like she yeah. loses a boot at one point she, and then her other sh- her other boots she fall into the water and she there's, like cons the dad there, and out of that money there's a lot of silly it, like if it's all tied into the fact that like she spoiler alert yeah you know there, there's people falling from balconies let's say yeah it happens um it happens. that seems to be just sort of like a, a theme that gets driven uh, into the ground with this in terms yeah. of people that are at risk of free falling and then do free fall yes. stuff stuff falling yeah i mean um, if, if we were trying to you know look at this movie like the way you'd look at a novel i suppose you could pull all kinds of symbols out you know? sure um red is a very strong theme this movie does watch kind of like a like a like a middle school honors right? novel yeah. or whatever in a way in the sense that it's like yeah everything's super obvious poison the name poison ivy is this obvious yeah. thing and, and then like, it's like an invasive species that yeah. gets into everything and and leaves i don't know i w- yeah it's all very obvious broad stuff but yeah. it's also the kind of thing that i could totally see like an honors english teacher being like yeah exactly what did the ivy mean what does that mean yeah um I mean, there's also some random shit that goes on. Ivy is introduced to us when a dog is hit, like by yeah. a car in the street, and it's near a kid's hangout. And all yeah. the kids are like, oh my God, a car. And so all the kids go running to like go look at the dog that's been hit by the car. And the dog is clearly going to die, but he's suffering and panting. And out of nowhere, Ivy comes up with a blunt object. I mean, some kind of pole or something. It looked like, like, like yeah, kind of like a baseball bat, but not. Yeah. And she, and she clubs the dog. You know, killing yeah. it instantly and like putting it out of its misery but that's how we're introduced to her that's how we're introduced that's to her well, after, after we see her <laughs> swinging on the, on the thing being all sort of like romanticized and slut shamed simultaneously right, because like how dare she wear a skirt while yeah she's, like so so like yeah swing. narrating of course is the like the the, the daughter sylvie, sylvie you know Gilbert. who who is right away just yeah. sort of projecting she, her, her lesbianism and simultaneous yeah. sort of like sheltered judgment of yeah, others she's like the, that she don't come is, from memes she's nursing like every resentment she has yeah you know like just tending to every one of them and like as a person who was introverted is you know mm-hmm. i'm like sort of insulted by like her performance or the the way she's written is that how people see us i don't want that representing yeah us. however i will say her style very cool like I, everything she wore is sure. like very in style. Oh, I right love her natural curls are just something oh, that too. To, to just die for. Oh, I, I also know, love I know. whenever people have like 
I've always wanted to do that like partial like shave type of deal yeah. on the side of the head thing. I've been told it's a trend thing. You're going you're gonna to regret it. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I still think that's just as cool. Yeah. Yeah. 2015 as I do now, I know. whenever a girl just splits her part and then boom, boom. Look, at, look at that. She's got leopard print or something. Yeah. In this case, it was, it was like a, she had just an eye. It was like an like eye of raw or eye, something. Yeah. It was like Egyptian, Egyptian symbol. She's got glasses and, you know, she wears kind of academic. What a freaking nerd. Yeah. Um, also, okay, this thing is set in L.A., but there are so many scenes where it rains. <laughs> I know. Oh, my God. Scully and I talked about that, too. We were like, this had to have been, this was shot in the one week period in L.A. where it rains because there's so much fucking. It, I counted it. There were four yeah, times. It was like during, four times. during the main, like the big car sex scene. Like that's when well, Scully was like, where did all this rain fucking yeah, come from? One time happens when uh, Ivy sleeps over and they're sleeping and it's raining outside. Yeah. The next one's when uh, Ivy's fucking the dad in, on the car um there's another one where like someone's like well they say it might rain later oh I'm my like, god oh, who's here? they uh i don't god. know and another time i think at the hospital i don't know that's so funny there a hospital? So, yeah, maybe I'm, it I'm did wrong. rain more in the 90s maybe it did maybe it did maybe we're it did. at that point now where yeah, we don't hard know to, it's hard to tell it's hard to speak to yeah. any of that um there's i some... vaguely remember rain yeah. i remember the memory of ma- of rain yeah <laughs> when it, when it falls it's like what is that Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Rain. Yeah. Also, this rich family, like, it's... I don't feel a ton of empathy for them. No. Like, they have a servant who... Yeah, Isabel they're just so weird. And, and they, the only... Like, she's literally in one scene, and it's just this it. weird we, sort of... She's kind of being treated like... Oh, yeah, like just shit. like an obvious, like, racial stereotype oh, yeah. and, like, shit. And just, like... You know, first the girl makes a, a fucking mess and it gets all over the floor, and then you it's kind of played as a comic relief. And the did not maid like looks, that. yeah, again, like I'm watching this from like this very classist eye that I have yeah. from the lower looking up, and I'm just like, these people are assholes who they kind are. Of, they um, like, I want Drew Barrymore to succeed. Yes, yeah, I want her to take over this family. <laughs> you were all for her. You were I was, in I, her was I was in for, I was like I don't she had I honestly style. don't need to know she was cool. any more of her history other than yeah. like even though she does awful things I sort of believed her her whole story. Yeah it, it's whether or not it, like she was doing that sort of thing where it felt ambiguous in the sense of like the Joker and the Dark Knight where you're kind of like I don't know if I, I don't think I can believe what these origin stories are. She's talking about her mom or her dad yeah. or her aunt or it was where a she, too she's a scholarship a story. kid, but it's this. And she but t- it- yeah. And she talked about it in this really, well, you know, mom, like just had to have Coke all the time or, or something. Yeah. It was just like, I wasn't buying it. So I, I, I felt like it was just pulled out to create that relationship with the mother. Right. Um, I also, there was a, uh, there's a scene where they decide to the friends to bond their friendship. They're like, let's get tattoos. And yeah. then they go to the grossest tattoo parlor I have ever Which is fucking crazy. seen. And because like, this girl has fucking money. Exactly. And they get like the grossest fucking tattoos. Yeah. And then like when they're like, oh, is it sterilized? And by the way, he the drink, literally just spits on her. Spits whiskey on the tattoo. So fucking like, gross. Um, and also I'm like, where did they get this bottle of whiskey? There's a lot of like bottles that just show up and I'm like, I know that like they're rich yeah. and maybe it doesn't matter, but I'm like, where are they getting this booze? I will say I did love the joke though when the guy's like how old are you guys and she's like i'm 21 <laughs> 22 and he's like your friend she's 30 that's <laughs> so fucking funny because i was like yeah that's yeah how, that is, that's a good joke that's, no it's good that's good no fun. that good funniness yeah they also hitchhike yeah. with a really gross dude at one oh, point right. I'm like that's crazy but i remember i wrote a note 30 minutes in still no sex also <laughs> i love you're um, clocking in i was sex. clocking the time i was upset um there were some bizarre music choices right right like tonally i couldn't figure out where this it movie was weirdly was. all over the place right? like sometimes there was sex and then sometimes it was like trumpet and then sometimes it almost sounded like a hair metal hair metal ballad there was a lot of weird shit in this movie it was odd the music yeah. threw me <laughs> that threw me yeah. um also, okay, Ivy immediately, like, worms her way in. 
and she's best friends somehow moves into the house like the friendship is so tight and it's just yeah. like okay she's here and the mom who's by the way the mother uh, in this family is dying we didn't mention that yeah right? we didn't mention this and i will also just i want to really drive the point home that i think she does the best performance in the whole film yeah. i think the mom is the, she's the most grounded performance cheryl ladd the first time we i really felt any sympathy for anyone in this film her presence in the story, as well as her performance in it, justifies a lot of other bullshit yeah. that happens around it. I agree. Up to, up to that point and then yeah. following. And just a little note, uh, Cheryl Ladd was an original Charlie's Angel. And of course, Drew Barrymore would go on to play a Charlie's Angel. I love I just that think symmetry. there's interesting. Look at that. Interesting. That's all. I love um, it. What else did I write down? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, she's wormed her way as family. She bonds with the dying mother really quickly. Mm -hmm. um both by like giving this like very sob story background and oh my scholarship kid like you mentioned yeah. and and then it's like you know there's this whole like well death isn't really a thing it's it's energy. a transformation of yeah. energy and she's like well let me know how, how ready you'll be to change into energy when, when you're, you're 38, 38. yeah it's like that is fucking young that's horrible. yeah it's super young and, and sad yeah and also like that dad is way older He's like almost 60 or something. Yeah, he's like, like a, a, well, he's just like a gross, like an older version of like a Tucker Carlson yeah, type figure who like nothing, got a hot model wife. There was nothing appealing about this guy. He plays like a newscaster dude, you know, and I guess and they have him saying the generic shit about just like people ruining society. Yeah, or whatever. he doesn't know. Yeah, we're not supposed to empathize with him and you don't. But yeah. then he's also like balding and there's a whole scene oh where, that was so fucking gross uh, well where ivy this is how she seduces him she just like runs into him one night i don't know on the stairs or something and he doesn't have his toupee on and then she like immediately like makes it clear to him that oh no i like it better this way and like you know art and basically she does that thing that people who are very seductive do which is they take that they find that flaw and they find it sexy like, yeah and that's like what gets people that vulnerability about you you feel is so, what makes you yes. so and that's what appealing. she figures out about each one of the people yeah. she finds what the like their vulnerability or what makes them tick and then she just like plum, like plummets into it and like, yeah let me give you what you want and so she's incredibly you know successful with this family like right. she gets all of them um the father has a party, like an important business party or something, which is just a plot device really for getting him alone or whatever with, yeah. with the girl. I mean, it did a lot of things, but I just remember there was like a moment where the camera's traveling through the party and you get like all these like snippets yeah, of dialogue. Which I really, I really liked that. There were a lot of really uh, artisanal choices with I mean, the cinematography in this movie. There's choices. Like they're, yeah. they're trying to do something interesting. Like I said, there's a lot of red, like red nails, red lips, red yeah. dresses, like red, you know, a big seductive color, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> You're like, yeah. <laughs> no, I just because I also was thinking about that pink sequin dress, and I'm right. just like, I love some of the like the the, the fat like the overall costuming of this film was really well done. Yeah, and I mean, like at that party, Sylvie was supposed to help, but then Ivy has basically arranged it so that Sylvie has to go and do some tutoring thing, and so that she can be alone with the dad and like come and maybe I can help. Maybe I can help, and then she gets dressed up to help like serve drinks at this party she looks like a waitress from like a monte carlo casino like, yeah she, she looks hot it's a, like it's incredible like it's like wait a minute <laughs> like suddenly her hair's all swept up and like yeah it's just i do i also do appreciate like the way they handle like the transformation of drew barrymore's character into the mom with the mom handing yeah like basically letting her take clothes from yeah. her because it's like oh finally like a girl who is a, a, a surrogate or, daughter or whatever yeah. who appreciates yeah my stuff yeah and even like, the right we haven't talked about it. even like there's a dog that they establish early on only like sylvie but then its mm -hmm. loyalty even switches uh -oh. to that dog there's some red flags there's like yeah some pills go missing right that's like a thing I think Drew watching people through glass. Like mm -hmm. at one point I'm like, oh that's creepy, you know. Um there's also like all those Polaroids that got pulled out. I keep calling her Drew, but like Ivy is like trying to study the family and like yeah. find there were all these like small little things going yeah. wrong that, yeah. that don't ever really get directly resolved because they don't need to, but like things start kind of going amiss. Yeah. You know? And like it's a really slow lead up actually. 
at the party is when there's almost a kiss, right? Yeah. And the wife walks in on it and then they have to backpedal like crazy. Yeah. But like then Ivy drugs the mom with some champagne and then okay, and the plot synopsis I read, they said that, oh, at that point, uh the dad is is kissing Ivy's legs. I'm like, no, he went down on her. <laughs> like, on oh his yeah, wife's obviously. Like, no, it's to... obvious. Yeah, she, he he yeah he performed the cunnilingus. Kind of yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought so too. Yeah, but I think whoever wrote that thing was innocent. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Or they or like, were just they didn't. Maybe they didn't want to spoil it. Right. Uh, also, spoiler like, alert. And like before he does that, like she's like rubbing her foot in his crotch, and I mean it was like very gross. No, like, she like, like clearly like, has an orgasm she, when. She yeah, goes, yeah. You know, okay. does all the stuff that indicates yeah. an and orgasm. Like, so the sick dying wife is like us dead asleep on the bed while they're doing this. I'm yeah. like, that's pretty disgusting. Yeah, like I, I'm, the the husband is supposedly so racked with sadness about losing his wife, and Ivy can be this replacement. No, he's just fucking. He's just a fucking gross piece he's of shit. Gross. He's no, just he, a gross piece of weak. shit. Fuck that guy. He's weak. He's yeah. fucking weak. So eventually, she kills the mom by pushing her off a balcony. <laughs> pretty straight up stuff straight up stuff yeah um i feel like no one can remember sarah gilbert's name i keep not remembering I, her name even though <laughs> it was yeah. it is such a boring like, no, like just ivy calls her coop because her last name's cooper it's sylvie but i could have sworn i heard like the mother call her sophie once like I, like <laughs> she she's no one knew this girl's of, name <laughs> yeah it's it's not important like like we don't we never know ivy's real name we never know sylvie's name either. yeah it's a uh, it's not great there's also a car crash at some point and despite yeah. the fact they're not wearing seat belts they basically just hit their heads and everyone's fine yeah that was odd and of course that becomes a plot point later because the bruising right. which i was yeah. like how did he not see he was fucking her how did he yeah, not exactly. see that bruise across not, her he chest he did not put two and two together Come there on. Like, he didn't figure it out hello oh my god um also i love that a nice punk like gave sylvia a ride i love that was like he's my favorite convenient character yeah. of all time like he's he's my favorite character since the night bus in harry potter wow. in terms of like okay. in terms of just having no significance at any other point in the story yep. just showing up getting the character from point a to point b not asking questions yep. because he's a weirdo so why is he gonna ask her he just tells her oh nice i like your costume you do the blood yourself or whatever that's yeah. their way of trying to indicate this guy's not gonna question why not she's outside of the hospital yeah. in a nighty. yeah and then yeah, like yeah. he just takes her to exactly where she needs to go uh-huh. and then it's like have a good night and i'm like this is yeah that's the night bus in, night in bus. harry potter no, prisoner true. of azkaban okay. we never see the night bus again it has no significance in the rest of the story it's just a thing that got harry potter from privet drive to diagon alley yeah all right i just really wanted to flex no, I'm, my I'm, my very beginner level harry potter trivia knowledge i'm, I'm here for it i'm, I'm yeah. glad you did thank um, you yeah that's what that guy did though that guy yeah. was the night bus actually she got he she literally she literally got on the the american the los angeles night yeah. bus for a moment i was like oh is it halloween and he's like no he just doesn't care it's just like yeah and this think, is just a random fucking guy and i think that was like deliberate i do think it was kind of like supposed to be a little bit of relief yeah right like it's not a complication it's just like a ha huh, okay great. okay well she gets like, yeah. like at the end of the day we needed she to gets help he, we needed to find a way to justify how she could get from the hospital back to her house without it turning into this tedious like i feel like they just they were like and in so many places in the script, it's similarly like, okay, well, we need to get to this point in the story. Yeah. But we're at this point. How do we? How do we? Yeah. How do we just kind of? You're right. There were some clumsy, like we just alluded to it. There's there's a car wreck. And in the car wreck, Ivy was driving. But she tells the story like, oh, no, no, no. I wasn't driving. Sylvie was driving. And Sylvie yeah. ends up in the hospital. And it's this whole thing. But there's a bruise across Ivy's chest from the steering wheel. Between that moment and that scene, that's the night Ivy is like fucking her dad at home instead of on a on the hood of a car in the woods or whatever they did the first time. Right. Um, he's having sex with this woman, but he didn't notice this massive bruise across her chest until like way later when they're discovered and then there's the whole ruckus. He like notices the bruise like when they fall into a heap together or something outside. Yeah. And it just was like, wait a minute, like you didn't see that. And you know, that's the moment where he's like, oh, you were driving. Yeah. You know, it's like, like, what? Okay. okay. And that suddenly like yeah. changes everything. It's like, yeah. And then Sylvie has a revelation about 
oh, my mother didn't kill herself. She was pushed when she catches Ivy humming a song that was like a song that Sylvie wrote for her mother's birthday that her mother used to listen to on this like cassette over and, and that over. was the cassette that her mom was listening to. to it's like oh you were in the same room as her yeah <gasps> but it, it's like didn't she not see her when she like when it happened it's like yeah that Sylvie walked in and saw Ivy in the bedroom at that point didn't she no Ivy hides on the balcony oh shit yeah okay but it's like mind. it's just such a clumsy way for her to figure out that her mom didn't jump right you know yeah it was a very it was a hastily decided thing and also too if sylvie had like a single brain cell she wouldn't have brought (laughs) that up while drew barrymore was struggling to drive stick shift on a very windy fucking road the windiest road in los angeles yeah like okay yeah now i'm gonna bring up that you murdered my mom when you are like clearly in the 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 vantage point to fucking kill me that was a good time yeah yeah as we said though um we're not fans but it was a critical favorite and Interesting. Uh, it kind of changed Drew Barrymore. A lot of horny dudes. Yeah, a lot of well, horny Tom Skerritt. Apparently, Sundance was very horny that year because it was nominated for a grand jury prize for best film. Wow. Which I'm like, wow, okay. Well, um, it was produced by New Line Cinema, which I recently have learned. Um, New Line kind of they, they no longer exist; they're defunct. But they had a real reputation uh, for trying different and weird stuff, and like mm-hmm. really trying to do different and strange things so i feel like this falls into that purview yeah. um we already talked about the cast a little bit um so this had a uh, a budget of three million it only grossed 1.8 million and it was such a limited release this was only released in 20 theaters interesting total. why was that i'm not really sure it um protested it, so it couldn't have done well like it didn't have a chance to do yeah well, you know yeah it did gain a following when it started appearing on cable and in mm-hmm. VHS. And it does kind of feel like the sort of thing like, you know, some 14 year olds would, would rent from Blockbuster and watch together in the dark or something. You know? Yeah, no, totally. Although I think we got better ones than this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the studio wanted a teenage fatal attraction. And there were there was a concept being kicked around, but the studio brought in uh cat shay to direct it because cat shay had directed a lot of really low budget movies for roger corman mm. um but they always made money so you know they had this like sure thing somebody who had proven herself a number of times and right. like and she's done other films we'll get into that but um you know they they felt like she was the right choice for this and i wouldn't call this Well, I'm not calling it that. Janet Maslin from the New York Times said the film was feminine, though hardly feminist. Mm. And I think that's like a really interesting and accurate read. Yes. Um, Yes. Because there are moments that feel like female gaze. There's a lot of like lead up and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of foreplay that before anything gets like too far. And it's it's all about the lingering moments. You know, nothing happens too fast. But I don't know. It still feels. Yeah. No, it's still it's still gross. (laughs) Yeah, it's still um, gross. I have a few other reviews here. Yeah. Roger Ebert was not a fan. Interesting. <laughs> he said, there's scarcely a moment in the movie when the story works as fiction. I was always aware of the casting, of the mood setting devices, of the stylistic borrowings from Hitchcock. So he wasn't into it. Peter Travers, Rolling Stone, said, Poison Ivy moves beyond wickedly erotic fun to become an acutely unsettling psychological thriller. So he was into it, I guess. He was horny. I think he was. Uh, One more from the Boston Globe. Not a fan. Um, Poison Ivy isn't that much of a film, but part of its charm is that it doesn't pretend to be. Uh, It is, however, a great showcase for Drew Barrymore as bad news jailbait. I guess that's kind of a positive review. Sure. Um, Like I said, I mentioned earlier, there were a few noisy walkouts when it did happen at Sundance. Like you were either enthralled by this or insulted. Right. It was like one of of the two. The New York Times also kind of described it as a commercial art film. Mm. I think that's kind of a fair. Interesting. Commercial art film. Yeah, Yeah, I could see that. It's worth mentioning that um, Kat Shea, her work has been featured both at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, mm-hmm. of the British Film Institute. Like yeah. she, she does have you know some laurels, uh, and she and she did a number of things. Um, I mentioned the Roger Corman stuff, but she made the film Streets uh, in 1990, which mm. was basically Christina Applegate's first film. Mm. So it kind of introduced her career. Um, Shay uh, was well, she's from Detroit, Michigan originally, so she's a Midwesterner, and she originally studied to be a teacher. But then it was like nah, at 19 or something, she just like, I'm out of here. I got to go to Hollywood. And yeah. Did the thing a lot of people do where they pack up 
and they move. Yeah. Um, Good for her. Um, she was for a while doing acting and modeling. She was at UCLA for a little bit, but didn't finish. Well, I, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but when she was a kid, she used to direct plays in her backyard mm. and like use the neighborhood kids. She described herself as a misfit. She's like, I didn't have any friends. So I put all my energy into doing this kind of stuff. And she was like, it was great. Like, and having no friends turned out to be really good for me because she even made money doing it because neighborhood parents would want their kids in it. And right. I don't know. I don't know. How, she must have been very organized at that shit. But um, I just think it's interesting that she she spent like seven years as an actress, which she didn't even really enjoy like mm-hmm. at all, which I'm like, how do you yeah. succeed as an actress? Um, yeah, right. You don't even like it. It's like, fuck you. A, yeah, you already <laughs> no. don't like it. And you're um, dead. Yeah. Yeah, I only did it for a little while. But um, but I think that's important because um, actors who work with her do say that like she really gets the best out of them. Like she she respects actors. She, yeah. she makes them. She helps break the ice. She helps make them feel safe. And um, a lot of people like working with her for that reason. Um, but when she was an actor, she had a small role in Scarface. Mm. She was in Psycho 3, which was directed by Anthony Perkins, the guy who plays, you know, Norman Bates. Right. And got a lot of directing lessons, I guess, from that experience. Wow. Like she really spent a lot of time watching him work and like seeing what he had to do. And he was under so much pressure because it was this like his directing debut. Plus it was this franchise film. And like, I mean, I've never seen Psycho 3, but people are like, eh, it's got some merit. I'm like, eh. Okay. okay i'm not sure i'm not sure she was she was also in some other things i'm not as familiar with such as the barbarian queen preppies my tutor and hollywood hot tubs <laughs> so wow those yeah. all have names that sound like things that i would have seen but are not things i've seen yeah i know what you mean yeah <laughs> um she met andy rubin who she later married on location in the philippines working on a film they started writing together and they wrote a script for roger corman and Corman directed it and once that was produced he sort of trusted them to write more scripts and so she also did uh, Strip to Kill and mm. Strip to Kill 2 which mm. were all kind of thrillers that were about set in a strip club. to kill. Yeah and uh, evidently I don't know if this is true or not you know but she uh, sort of was like you know no one had put pole dancing in a movie yet and I went out to these strip clubs mm. and I was like pole dancing is amazing this right. has got to be in the movie like, right um, so, oh so then uh, Zola has, has has a little connection a little connection maybe. there but uh, again I don't know if she it's like people will like claim things like oh I think we were the first to do that yeah it's like you might not have been. You Probably know? not. I mean, Paul McCartney does that a lot. But. Yeah. <laughs> like, we came up with feedback. Like, okay. We <laughs> well, that's a little, it's that's like, pretty I, broad. I invented the internet. Oh um, my God. Yeah. Um, so she's directed a number of things. Probably the biggest thing is she did the sequel to Carrie the rage oh she did the rage carry too yeah this movie has a lot of similar vibes to the rage carry too talk more about that um it, i mean it's it's campy as shit it's campy <laughs> it's super high melodrama yeah there is something like oddly very honest about the teenage experience between both films to give it praise but not in the sense that it's adding any sort of depth or flip but it it, yeah. it sort of does capture the like high melodrama yeah and the emotionality that happens i mean carrie was um, melodrama for sure yeah you know? like the rage is not it's not a good movie but what i vaguely remember from it because i haven't watched it in a long time no, okay. and it was also similarly a tv movie that yeah. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. that you know they used she's, to yeah. she's done a lot of direct she's done a lot of this kind of like yeah. or just stuff that like starts to get syndicated or whatever i guess you know it's yeah. i think there's something about the budding sexuality of teenagers that i do want to give her credit for despite the fact neither of the neither of these movies i have seen are movies that i'm yeah gonna recommend no, to people but, probably. but it's trying to handle that in a different way you know yeah i mean um, it's a it's a it's a, t- it's a tough subject yeah to tackle there are very like um, adult yeah. emotions that get entangled in that and like sure. something about the rage carry too that i do appreciate about it is yeah that it is a movie that's it's it's very horny it's very <laughs> melodramatic but there's like there is a tinge of um self-awareness about it mm-hmm. that i do kind of appreciate and again yeah. i watched it i haven't even watched it in like the last 10 years so yeah, like yeah. i could be talking no, out I, of my ass it, and I it's mean, even worse than i remember kind of like but of, of all the sort of like uh sequels to you know stephen king stuff like people regard that one pretty highly i like, would say you know it's, it's one it's, of the better yeah to be t- to be creating a sequel based off Stop. of off of something like carrie yeah. to begin with and it's already such a yeah 
it's already such a tough work to adapt. Yeah. yeah. Well, she cites Brian De Palma as an influence. So, mm-hmm. you know, interesting that she got to like do the addition to that. She also has cool. pointed out that Federico Fellini and Dario Argento, who we've talked about with Suspiria. Yes. That's a huge influence. I, I can, can totally, totally see, see that, of these right? now. It's I think got a there is Jallo going on. Yeah. Like she has this. Uh, I don't like Brian De Palma. So it doesn't surprise me that I didn't like this. There you, you go. Know? Like, Whereas I'm kind of like, oh, I can appreciate someone who appreciates the. Yeah. That, that is reveling in the camp. of yes. Like. Yeah. I and, guess in a sense like female yeah. objectification yeah. or whatever. Well, like Yeah, and, and she she cited Argento specifically for color. And I guess certain films like the film I mentioned earlier, Streets with Christina Applegate, the director mentioned, Oh, that was when I was going through my my yellow phase. Mm. And so like you know, the production designer would be doing things like pushing red and blue cars out of frame just to make sure that everything was kind of in this palette same palette you know? yeah. and you know she said honestly it's the kind of thing she described putting in a lot of work that people don't really see or appreciate yeah. and it sort of makes you question oh should we have bothered you know yeah um so i think that's interesting she also cited Sidney lumet as an influence and of course we brought him up when we uh talked about network so mm-hmm. there's a lot of like threads coming she's got, back she's got she's got an appreciation for the classics i mean she's right in there with a lot of what we've been yeah. discussing Again, which is why it's like, it seems like it overall, between both films, there is like a self-aware camp to them. Yeah. You know, between, well, between uh, Poison oh, and Ivy I mean, and Carrie, the, uh, the Rage Carrie too, at least. Oh, um, and I mean, like, Roger Corman is the godfather of campy horror, you know. And I was just really impressed yeah. because I think as much as I'm not a, a maybe like, maybe this, her style isn't my cup of tea, but I... I was pleased to learn just about like what an interesting woman and like what an interesting body of work. Right. You know, like we don't, why don't we hear about her? You know, that like she seems as, as legit as any, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, she is currently an acting teacher. She directed something in 2019 and I think she got some other projects coming up, but she hasn't been directing as much, um, mm. which makes me a little sad actually. And uh, well, we like you, Kat. Just saying, like, we if you want to like take you. a, do you want to talk shit about your movie? But we like you. No, but we, but we're for you. Yeah. Um, we're no, I'm just, all I'm saying is she, she offers acting classes, and you can do it online over Zoom and shit. So you know, well, right. check her out. I don't there know. She might be a really great teacher. I mean, that's uh, a big part of her life, I guess. So um, I think that's interesting. I, I, I feel like my questions, my lingering questions about this movie are just like. Could she have not found a hotter dad? I know. Oh, my God. It took me out of it so much because it was so hard. Like, I mean, I guess that just says what a pervert I am. But I know I'm not the only person who just like as soon as you saw the the dad, you're like, oh, man. And we see his little butt. Oh no! You know? And he's still does it. I'm already not big on facial hair, but this guy, uh, like, come no, on. You know? um, also. I want to project a little bit. Like, like why on. is there no railing on the balcony? Because, like, That's, that would get in the way of the plot. Get the, I mean, they could have <laughs> pitched over the... I'm just, I was like, that is so dangerous. It's so fucking dangerous. I would never be on that balcony because, yeah. like, my fear of heights would just... I'd be, like, plastic. Yeah, down. I would be freaking out. Be it reminds me of, like, in Game of Thrones when what's his... Peter Dinklage's character. I can't even remember the names of characters. I never Tyrion, because well, good for you. You'll, you it's nothing yeah. but disappointment at the end. Okay. Um, but like at one point in the in the first or second season, he gets like he's jailed, but he's jailed in what is essentially like a carved out space on the side of a cliff that's about the oh. size of this room. Oh no. And like where this wall is doesn't exist. Right. It's just, just open. It's just open. So he has to be, he's always like up against the wall here looking out yeah. and it's just a sky and Yikes. fall yeah that's he, that's a nightmare yeah that's a, like a little bit of a nightmare yeah fucking freaky like, like that's what that balcony reminds me of yeah i mean i don't have any um irrational fear of heights i think i have a pretty normal fear yeah i think i have a pretty rational fear <laughs> i think i have a rational i have a pretty fear rational fear of dying like in general yeah that's yeah how I feel I'm, too. I'm not i'm not comfortable i have nightmares about falling like yeah you know, like we all do yeah um, exactly man wasn't meant to fly <laughs> uh, my only other question is is sylvie in prison 
because like she kind of killed her in the end right yeah i mean i guess how like, are they gonna i guess they will between her rich. and the dad well because the, the dad obviously yeah. is like i mean are they gonna tell the cops the whole story from or what they like, would just say she fell from the I balcony guess, yeah. i guess i guess they just lie which huh? is just like wow two in a week that's that crazy a little excessive this is the same detective coming over twice just like I mean, wow y'all gotta put a rail on that balcony yeah, okay seriously. that's some crazy we shit we told you last time <laughs> yeah like one more time we're not even gonna send anyone out here yeah how many more accidents you guys gonna have i'm starting to think yeah. you're doing it on purpose the house was pretty ugly too i just want to say is that like hacienda I, style whatever it just had no character I it don't was know. not it reminded me of a lesser version of the fancy house that um robin tunney's character lives in in the craft which was also yeah, like a like yeah. a this hacienda does, style this feels bougie home. Kind of similar to the craft in some ways. I don't know why. It's just because like they're it, both made in the nineties and melodramatic teenage. Yeah, uh, it's, you know it's funny. I wonder. I don't think it is teen rage, like, teen girl rage. Yeah. Yes. Teen girl rage. That's it. Is it maybe like the same house? Did they film in the same house? I could totally see it being the same, like, like, like uh, neighborhood, neighborhood and like off of Laurel Canyon right. or something. I just felt like there was some, were there like a lot of steps leading up to one of the house? I don't know. Yeah. I have to watch the craft again, I guess. I don't think it was the same house because like also, I remember that at the one shot at one point yeah. <laughs> early in the film when Drew Barrymore is just like, wow you live there or whatever it's yeah. just like it is this giant it's fucking castle behind on a the hill. girl yeah and it's just it also just makes that girl sylvie like immediately less likable to me oh, like, i have so much less sympathy for you that yeah. you're like such a little shit she's all the way shit. up to this point and like acting like you have ethics and you go oh yeah like what? she's you know she's doing that like angsty teenage thing where you're like i know what's true you know i mean it's like it's a yeah. very like predictable kind of trope of of teenageness but i mean they very casually mention early on in the film that she called in a bomb threat which is her fucking crazy dad's office because he's a dude on the no, news and he's like he's legitimately like worry he's gonna like lose his job he does lose his job yeah. and it's a whole thing like she fucks his her she, father's life up just to be a bitch i mean like one thing ebert's really had a problem with was the casting he really he kind of su suggested maybe sarah gilbert and drew barrymore should have been swapped in those roles hmm. which i'm not sure i agree i just it's just an interesting thought experiment. Not that I think that Sarah Gilbert's a bad actress, but I would have been down for like two Drew Barrymore's, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think like no, if, I, if there was a little more of a... No, I mean, I, I'm with you because I... I I like Sarah Gilbert because of the character Darlene sure. like in Roseanne. Like I think as a girl growing up who also yeah. didn't really want to fit into like a typical mold, like Darlene felt like a kindred spirit. Yeah. But in this, I feel like the writing's just... It's just so not much very forgiving for... Like, like Sarah, I feel like she did what was what was written for her. But at the same time, if there had been an actor yeah. in that role that was playing it with, a like, a bit more self-awareness or something. Yeah. Like, like, if that character was just a little bit smarter, which yeah, I don't know if I the agree. script even had room for that. I don't... Like, yeah, I think the script had... Everyone kind of had to be a little bit clueless. Everyone had to be a little for dumb. For it to work. Yeah. Which, I mean... <laughs> I guess that's one way. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that was what bothered me about it. Yeah. It was I felt I felt, it felt very insulting at times. I agree. Sure. Like you're either really into this or you're like Oh, it was so gross. Just every time every time kissy kissy happened and yeah. I'm looking over to Scully just like, babe, no, oh. I hate it. I'm hating this. And then just be he was on Reddit just like looking at yeah. cats. He was just completely yeah. getting just having a better time than me. Yeah, sensible. Well, I'll, I'll take the yeah, I'll take the hit for this one. Um No, you're okay. <laughs> you're good. I'm glad we watched it. Same. And I'm I'm glad that the name Cat Shay is now like in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. This wasn't like the last unicorn where like no. it was just like that was, wow, I hated no. every second of it. Like I'm, I appreciated this movie. No, no. I mean, I didn't I you know, it's funny. I realize like we we say this a lot. We don't rank things. We don't do that. But I think the question, would you watch this again? No. I, no. I definitely would Truly not. Truly no. Because no. it just it just annoys me so much. Yeah. Even if it was on in the background. No. And I think that says something, too, that even though I do remember, I distinctly remember this being on TV multiple times, that, like, I wouldn't power through and continue to watch it. Oh, no. it, didn't, it didn't grip me because no, no. it's... No, it I, wasn't for me then, and it's still not for me now. I know that this would never happen now because the way it is, but it's like, even if this was being shot on a plane, 
Like no. it was the only option. No, like I'll what close kind of my plane eyes. Are you I know. Right? I'm, I'm like talking about a plane. Airlines book, like get booked. Like, I'm talking oh. about a plane from 1995. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where like there's yeah. one screen and you all have headphones. Oh, I remember that. And you're shit. like craning your neck. That's over how this. I watched Where the Heart Is. I saw something that way. I can't remember, but that was how we used to watch movies on planes, yeah. guys. It was one movie That's and we all wild. had to watch it together well, like you were in school. Oh, uh, there's something communal about that that I can, I I mean, can vaguely appreciate. Yeah, I, if it was a good movie, like if they were going to put on like a, a really dumb comedy, like, sure. and, like Spaceballs or something, like, oh, hell yeah. I'd That'd watch, be one thing if they were putting on like a legit movie. I mean, but watch that with like a bus fucking, full of people sure that'd like, be fun but you know. no no yeah where no, the no. heart is was just an okay viewing experience. is that the one about the girl in the walmart the girl in the walmart that's exactly that's the, the one. one girl in the walmart that's exactly the one she's right. got yeah sure her her baby daddy just like okay. abandons her at walmart yeah it's fucked totally fucked but luckily she's natalie portman and she powers she's through really pretty yeah she's really well but also too like stalker channing is just a n- super nice lady too you yeah. know she can play a bitch really well though yeah stalker no she's great she played a good like strong female sturdy, protagonist a sturdy you know? woman yeah um and then like sally field makes a little cameo in there and then Ashley Judd's in it for a minute. And then right. yeah, t- there's like some other people. I, I got to say that just that description and who's in I'm like, that is just dripping with estrogen. Any miscellaneous feels, aftertastes? Like, oh, with Poison Ivy? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have a rash now. <laughs> I did not enjoy it. I would not rewatch it, but I appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And it would live in, it, it's in the same vein as like, Clifford is actually a better movie than this, but they're both movies that are like, I mean, not ones I would jump to rewatch, but are both appreciated. You know what? If Charles Grodin had been the dad, this well, that would have been, been hot. That would have that would have been hot. That's that would have been. This would have been a five star movie if Charles Grodin was. Even was, if it was nothing else changed, yeah, it was just tra- it was just Charles yeah. Grodin, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we can't always get we can't always get what we want. Well, know? all right, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, check us out on our socials and don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email us at uh, breathoffreshmovie at gmail.com. Yeah. Uh, not just breath of fresh movie. It's a, a breath, breath of, of fresh, fresh movie. movie. Did I not say a? No, you did. Okay, I just like, right. I want to double emphasis because I'd yes, be the kind of dumb, yes. dumb listening and still thinking, did she mean it or no? Yeah. It, no, it's in there. Yeah. You, you a know. breath of fresh movie yeah. at gmail.com. And uh, if you're, yeah, if you're on the socials, it's uh, at fresh movie pod. Thank you, listeners. Thanks. Thank you for your ear holes. I mean it, though. Your brain holes. We recently, we're now on uh, a podcast service called Ghana. So which cool. Is, which is, uh, it's like India's answer to Spotify. We're streaming in we're, India. We're streaming. How did that happen? We are like, that was streaming. just like, did was yeah. that like... I just, I submitted, I, found, I discovered that this is a thing that exists. I'm like, well, just submitted. I submitted it. That's cool. People are, people are listening. 